Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading video for Friday, April 21st, 2023. I think this is going to be even shorter than my last video, I guess, uh, because in my last AM reading video, it was my first one of the month, so I was basically covering about half a month's worth of reading, and now I'm back down to a week. <laughs> That uh, video was surprisingly short for me. It feels like a lot of my AM reading videos are like upwards of like 25, 30 minutes. <laughs> but anyway, maybe I'm feeling less rambly unless I, you know, prove myself wrong here in this video. So uh, here we go. As always, the first thing I'll do in these AM reading videos is talk about the next short story I read in this anthology, uh, Oi Caramba. It's an anthology of Jewish stories from Latin America, edited by Elan Stavins. And I'm slowly making my way through this. The story I read for this week is called Genealogies by Margot Glantz. Uh, she is a Mexican writer with uh, Jewish uh, Ashkenazi European descent. Uh, and this is a highly autobiographical uh, story. Uh, about uh, her family and she's like jumping around a lot from her father to her mother and to other people and their uh, recollections of uh, surviving uh, mostly it seems the Bolshevik Revolution that that's when they were still in uh, what is now Ukraine uh, and uh, there were just uh, waves of pogroms which are anti-Jewish violence uh, just sweeping around their home and uh, the various ways people survived sometimes by hiding when sometimes I guess the pogroms were mostly just about looting and if you were out of sight nobody would go looking for you or uh, you know at one point uh, somebody was like washing uh, uh, somebody who was bloody like a, a Cossack who they're an uh, ethnic group of people who often were at the heart of uh, the anti-Jewish violence and they survived that way and then ultimately they're like trying to get out of um, well, the for the uh, Russia uh, Empire slash Soviet Union, uh, and about their sort of travails to get out of that area, and then uh, into mostly they're trying to get to North America, and uh, it's uh, people are you know uh, uh, capping their quotas there. So there's a lot of back and forth about people and how they try to get out and how they ultimately arrive in uh, Mexico. Although it's not a very linear, easy to follow narrative in that way, but you get the understanding that. It really does feel autobiographical that these people are telling this to Margot in um, in a garden, like in the 80s, it seems like, because she mentions her father dying in 1982. Uh, and then there's also a little bit of anti-Jewish violence in Mexico, although then there's also people trying to help them. So that's, I guess, her trying to make sense of the violence in her family history. And this is technically the start of her work called Genealogies, which is something kind of that... Uh, reappears in this anthology that it's that we're actually talking about the start of novels and in this case actually uh Stavins does um specify that uh, like he seems to say this is memoir slash autobiography rather than auto fiction so uh, I guess uh, in a way it's like a short story but a non-fiction short story I don't know it's a interesting placement here anyway uh, but yeah it seems highly autobiographical uh, and if I were to pick up the book I assume it would be highly autobiographical I think there's also photos in it uh, and all sorts of things that point to non-fiction the first book I finished this week is Down Under by Sonia Tates. Uh, this is a book of uh, star-crossed lovers as sort of <laughs> and meeting up again in middle age after a sort of uh, violent uh, or abrupt uh, end to their relationship when they were teenagers. Uh, and then there's some side stuff going on as well. Uh, so these two people met in an, an American suburb, uh, Jude and Colum. Jude is a Jewish American girl and Colum is from a waspy and uh, somewhat uh, anti-Semitic and racist family as well. Uh, and uh, Jude had a father who was sort of uh, highly distrustful of non-Jews and just uh, constantly a bit paranoid about Jewish violence, which seems highly supported in this case when Jude uh, gets involved with Colum, whose father is uh, very violent towards him and also, you know, disseminating like anti-Jewish propaganda and, and just uh, racism all around and that sort of stuff. And uh, ultimately, Colum and his family, I think... Uh, I think they ultimately split from the father uh, and then he ends up growing up in Australia and becomes a very highly successful movie star. 
Uh, and then Jude uh, enters a more doldrums like, uh, I guess, uh, marriage and um, middle class, uh, you know, relationship of, uh, you know, growing up and living in a suburban world. Uh, but uh, Jude is always on Colum's mind as he grows increasingly more famous and ultimately he decides to sort of uh, follow that dream. He feels betrayed by her that uh, they were supposed to run away together and she didn't show up and little does he know that she tried to leave him a note because her father actually suffered a stroke at the last minute and she felt like she couldn't leave her family so she tried to explain that to him but he never got the message but he does go back. He tries on a variety of guises. It's almost like surreal especially when he um poses as a Hasidic rabbi who comes to stay with her. It almost feels like the start of a Jewish folktale when a random rabbi steps into your door and knows all about you and somehow Jude just sort of accepts this and it takes her a little while to realize that this is a column. And uh, they have a little bit of an affair, but things kind of go awry. Colum, much like his father, is a uh, just a, he has a lot of violence now that he's dealing with, like in his past, his backstory, and it also manifests itself in the same sort of like uh, you know anti-Semitism and uh, I don't know if he really gets into racism, but later he gets into just full-blown misogyny with her and other women. So there's that, uh, and uh, so. It's sort of about getting over this uh, doomed love affair from your teen years that uh, ends up not being uh, what you thought it was. Although I'm not sure that's what the author was going for. Certainly for me, when she was in her past chapters, it felt like Jude was written as someone who was very teenage and that in the moment she was so sure that she was right and that she was in like, you know, the ultimate love affair. And it just felt like, you know, you know, her hormones are just going over overdrive and, you know, it's the first time she's having all these all of these feelings and it's an understandable teenage emotion to sort of like see yourself as separate from your parents, especially going for someone your father doesn't like and feeling like you can save this this boy column and that sort of stuff and that, you know, you're destined to be together and like looking back and as a, an adult, you're supposed to realize, oh, you know, I went a little overboard because this was my first time dealing with any of this, but it feels like because of the way the relationship ended abruptly, even as a middle-aged woman, Jude kind of is in love with him. And even as the relationship really goes off the deep end and like, you know, she's realizing she's sitting there in this relationship with him and he's screaming at her and all these obscenities, personal and uh, religious obscenities. And I'm thinking, God, this is when you really just want to run for the hills. But even then, like she, it takes her a little while. And I mean, I get like the whole idea of being in a battered relationship, but I guess this one is so abrupt for one thing. She hadn't seen him for decades and then like it's just, you know, and the second time they see each other, this is all happening. So I don't know. I feel like I don't, I'm not sure Tate's uh, and her characters uh, saw the relationship as uh, uh, continually uh, uh, flawed as I did. I, 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 I maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The way she went through it, I, I guess it's just once it got to all of that anti-Semitic uh, and misogynist uh, violence with Colum as an adult, I just, you know, he was so distasteful to me that I just wanted a clean break or some sort of revenge plot or something like that. I'm just like, ugh, this is getting really gross now. Uh, and then on top of that, I do feel like the writing was a little iffy, the jumps back and forward in time, how we started with too much exposition in the beginning. I, I don't know, it's a, I think it was a little uh, amateurish, a little uneven in that way too. Although by the end, I think, uh, uh, you know, things were a little more established and she had more scenes that were like like in the present and had you know, emotional gravitas in the present. I, I wish that she, I just wish she'd focused elsewhere. I guess like, you know, Jude has this interesting relationship with her husband and her two sons. And I'm like, you know, in a way that just, it seems a lot more realistic and interesting than, you know, embarking on this love affair from decades ago where you, you know, and it's toxic and uh, it seems like you're not really uh, dealing with it all that well anyway. And I don't know, there were side characters as well, a really weird ending about him running away with someone else, it felt like to me. <laughs> uh, and uh, it felt like that you would think uh, that wouldn't end up well either, but we don't really see the end to that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know, I guess, you know, I, I, I had ups and downs with this, and I guess in, uh, maybe in the end I kind of just feel like... Uh, mediocre. <laughs> I guess that's what I'll go with. And now I'm in the middle of Meru by S.B. Divya. This is a recent publication. I have a whole thing where I'm trying to read a handful of uh, um, 
novels that are published this year for my mock reads goal, which is really my attempt to try to read some front lists that maybe I could vote for in the Goodreads Choice Awards, you know, way at the end of the year, you know, if those books are popular enough. No idea, really, if uh, this will be one of the top science fiction books or not, uh, but uh, I'm enjoying it. Uh, another reason I'm reading it right now is that I do like reading science fiction and fantasy, especially reading it, although I listen to a lot of it too, but I like reading a copy of a book when I am doing beta reading edits for my beta reading group, because I'm part of a science fiction fantasy beta reading group, so I find it kind of fun to be like, you know, doing a deep dive into their worlds while, you know, reading a polished and published uh, SFF work. So that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, so anyway, this is a kind of far future story. I think we're about uh, supposed to be about a millennium into the future. Uh, and the way things are going is that, um, you know, humans, we've continued to do our worst to the planet, as it were, and we also continue to develop technology, and that technology surpasses us, and uh, I think we have a little bit of hybriding, like with uh, humans and technology, and ultimately this uh, one phase of humans, you know, becomes so technologically advanced, like uh, the types of people that can live out in space, like, you know, as though they're spaceships themselves and that sort of thing, uh, that they decide, uh, we ultimately sort of cede, uh, as humans, we ultimately cede authority to them, and they keep us at, on Earth kind of as protected you know, subspecies in a way that uh, they're keeping us there. They're taking a few of our resources. They're doing all of the uh, space travel now and exploration and finding new worlds. But humans are seen to uh, be dangerous uh, and materialistic. And if we're left to our own devices, well, the types of uh, expansionism and uh, environmental decay that actually are happening now <laughs> and have happened in the history of us, <laughs> are ha they're afraid it'll happen again. Uh, so... Anyway, that's the backdrop for uh, this story. Also, I think in the backdrop, we did try to colonize Mars, and that went disastrously. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it has to do with uh, Elon Musk's recent uh, attempt to <laughs> launch a spaceship. But <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so we're, that's all in the backstory now, uh, and uh, everyone's sort of um, living their lives in this uh, future, and, and humans are still just restricted to Earth. Uh, and we have these two main characters. I mean, most humans, I think, we've they've been conditioned psychologically or so forth to, you know, not want much because that leads to, you know, uh, to, to disaster if we want too much and uh, our materialistic ambitions and greed get away from us. But our uh, main character here is a, a woman called Jayathi who was raised by two alloys. Uh, and... Um, so I guess because they condition, they, they don't have this conditioning to not want much. They, their child, uh, you know, is having this, uh, you know, dream to, you know, prove herself in some way and also maybe to prove the worth of humanity. Like she really wants to get off planet and uh, she wants to do something with genetics uh, to like maybe uh, help uh, the remainders of humans. Uh, and But uh, something comes across that uh, the alloys have found this hospitable planet named Meru. Uh, that they're able to get to, uh, and she um, petitions the government uh, to be able to uh, live on this planet uh, and uh, prove that a human can live on a planet without like causing huge environmental damage. And then if she can do that, and there's other stages of the experiment about like th that the planet will be healthy and she as a human will be healthy, uh, and that uh, maybe ultimately it will become uh, a new refuge for humans because the earth is still kind of in bad shape and uh, maybe it would be nice uh, for humans to be able to have a new place to live as well. Uh, and so it's contentious uh, in the government to allow a human to live off world uh, and so forth, but ultimately it passes, except that one member of like an anti-human faction that just wants to keep them on earth and, you know, docile, uh, sets a, a mission in place to sabotage uh, this mission. So Jayathi goes off and she is aided by an alloy who uh, is a ship. She's a spaceship uh, called Vaha. I mean, I mean, that's... I mean, I guess that's a human-centric way of thinking of this alloy, that actually she thinks it, she's a pilot, is technically what she is. But for humans, she pilots uh, herself, and she ha is big enough to have, like, you know, a uh, part of her body where uh, Jayathi can live <laughs> for months on end as they travel to Meru. Um, 
I don't know. It's, I feel like this is so alien, but I, I mean, I remember watching Farscape, which I love, and technically Moya was a living ship, but I think uh, there was still that distance. Moya was still like an alien, whereas Jaha is supposed to be, you know, she's she's still very human in, in, in her way, although actually alloys and humans don't always see each other as the same species anymore. But ultimately, of course, this is about the two of them forging a relationship and like they don't have much contact. Uh, they, they, I mean, Jayathi doesn't have much contact with alloys who aren't her parents and uh, Vaha hasn't had much contact with humans, uh, but they go to Meru, uh, and there's a thing about Vaha, I mean, obviously she's, you know, the si she's the size of a ship, basically, or at least, uh, you know, several, much larger than uh, Jaya, but, but to live on a planet, she uh, sort of embodies her uh, consciousness in what's called an incarn, which is a lot more human-shaped uh, uh, sort of uh, organism that she grows in an external womb, and there's all sorts of fascinating, like, future science stuff in here. <laughs> and anyway, so they're actually getting to know each other and maybe uh, controversially getting very romantically involved, and meanwhile, uh, one of Vaha's uh, anti-human friends is uh, part of uh, this plot by the uh, anti-human government to sabotage the project. So that's uh, the major conflict they're dealing with is how do they, you know, make sure that their uh, project on Mirror goes okay when someone is actively trying to sabotage it, but they don't know ex exactly how they're trying to actively sabotage it. So yeah, uh, you know, it's just one of those big expansionist novels. I mean, I read this sort of stuff and I feel like the science is fascinating and also a bit overwhelming and beyond me. I fall for the characters, although sometimes in a book like this, like everything is, uh, I don't know, so uh, embroiled in the in the science and the politics that it's sometimes, I don't know, I feel like the characters are, I don't know, a little flat to me, but maybe it's because like, you know, from my vantage point in the 21st century, there's just so much world building around them that uh, they don't quite feel as human anymore because everything they're dealing with is so beyond me. And it's a, it's a little nitpick. I mean, ultimately, I feel like I'm really invested in the story, even if like, uh, I don't know, it won't be a five star read. Maybe it will, maybe, I think it'll at least be a four star read for me. Uh, I'm really enjoying this. I really love the creativity. I. And it's also based on a myth, which itself came from a millennium ago, I believe. So how cool is that? <laughs> so it's just kind of cool how stories can evolve, like, you know, from past to present to future like this. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'll be checking back. And the final thing I'm in the middle of on audio is The Facemaker by Lindsay Fitzharris. This is historical nonfiction and somewhat of a biography, especially of the man who became famous for doing uh, facial uh, reconstruction, plastic surgery type stuff uh, in World War I, when I believe, uh, you know, that field of uh, facial reconstruction, plastic surgery, and also dental work really uh, took on a new meaning and a new life after World War I and that particular uh, bout of technology and violence. Uh, could really do a number on uh, survivors that, you know, you came back with these horrible uh, facial wounds like never before and survived them. And so it jump-started uh, the whole discipline of uh, trying to uh, save these men through plastic surgery and the like. So uh, we're just going through all of that. And that is all I will tell you for now because I am reading this book uh, for the BookTube Prize. Uh, so the BookTube Prize was started by Robert at Barter Hordes a couple of years ago. The goal is for the literary BookDernet community to judge the best in uh, fiction, liter literary fiction and nonfiction published in English in the U.S. Uh, the year before this one. So we are now in the middle of uh, round two of four. We're in the quarterfinals of uh, judging 2022 books, and I'm officially judging uh, nonfiction ballot A. Uh, so I will be pitting this book and five others against each other. Uh, once I read them all, uh, to, uh, you know, rank them and, and say which ones I want to move on to the next round and which I want to, you know, be eliminated from the BookTube Prize. Uh, but bef until then, I have to keep my uh, lips mum, uh, my lips zipped, as it were. Uh, so, because as an official judge, uh, I don't want to be influenced and I don't want to influence anyone else. So that's all I'll say, except to say that... Uh, I'll leave information to the BookTube prize down below. Also, I did make a preliminary thoughts video on this uh, ballot before I started reading anything, so if you want to know those thoughts, I'll leave that video down below as well. So that about covers it for me now. Had a kind of shocking end to the week, really. Uh, I was uh, calling my parents, or my dad in particular, on the way home from work. 
And he told me uh, that uh, we had a very sudden death in the family just a couple of days ago. Um, my third cousin uh, died very suddenly, and she was 57, seemingly in good health. And people couldn't get in touch with her for a couple of days, so they went to check on her, and then they they found that she passed away. Uh, and it's just very sudden. In fact, she, I believe, is having an autopsy done just to figure out what the cause of death is. Uh, I wasn't very, I didn't know her very well, I wasn't very close to her, but, uh, you know, it's sort of rocking my father's generation a bit, uh, I mean, the child of one of his first cousins, uh, so, I don't know, it's in the back of my mind, it's just uh, this uh, shocking reality of what we have to deal with, and a reminder, really, of just how, you know, life can be snatched away, how precious it can be, uh, you know, and so, I don't know, it's, it's something I've also been thinking of, as I'm, I don't know, I have this, uh, I'm, I'm writing my own fantasy novel, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopefully going to be around for a while longer, but, uh, you know, I'm thinking about how it's just a goal of mine. I'd love to see it finished, uh, and you just never know. And I just hope that, uh, you know, my, my cousin went quickly and painlessly. I just, uh, <laughs> oh, it's a way to end the week, a kind of uh, just a reminder of mortality. Uh, so, yeah, that's what's going with my, the mindset I'm in right now. <laughs> um, Anyway, it is also still uh, National Poetry Month, even as we're, you know, inching closer to the end of April. But uh, on that note, I hope to be back uh, in a couple of days and I'll be reading and reviewing this collection, Today in the Taxi by Sean Singer, and my <laughs> obligatory annual nod to one collection of shorts uh, of poetry. <laughs> uh, so yeah, looking forward to diving into this and stay tuned. I hope you are all having a good weekend, hugging loved ones close, and getting some good reading in as well. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.